Thank you. Thanks, Trisha. Really appreciate um, coming back this year. I'm excited about this presentation. I hope um, everybody will be able to take away a few things from it. Um, and I've tried really hard to make it interesting. So, um, I, cause I appreciate your time. I know it's a Saturday and I'm actually glad it's snowing. So, um, hopefully you're not missing out on too much or wanting to be outside. So, um, like Trisha said, I'm an occupational therapist. Um, I let's see, um, oh, let me tell you what you're going to need to prepare for this first. So just, this is where you're going to need the blindfold or um, an old pair of eyeglasses with some Vaseline would be great. Um, reading glasses would work great, um, but have that Vaseline handy if you could. A cup of water or something to drink, um, spoon, fork, plate, finger foods, other foods, um, toothpaste, toothbrush, just have it in the bathroom. That can be something you can maybe do after this um, presentation. So if you don't have those things, just grab them or grab them while we're, while I'm going through this, but, um, cause I want you to try some things to really, really get the feel of what I'm trying to, um, get across. So, um, this is just an outline. Uh, welcome all of you. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, I'm going to go over the senses and I'm going to include in there stereognosis and tactile defensiveness in case um, you're not familiar with those. They're super important. Um, we're going to go through those activities that I mentioned. We're going to do the developmental norms. Um, those are also important just in knowing what comes, well, what the, how the stage is, how it's supposed to be to how development progresses naturally. And then I'm gonna go over the Just Right Challenge and um, then we're gonna go through some more independent living skills, tips and tricks. I'll be adding some of those as we go, but the end part will also be part of that. So as Trisha said, I'm from CESA 5. I have worked in the schools for um, 19 years. I had five years prior to that. The schools go from age three to 21. Um, but I've also worked nursing, skilled nursing, pediatric outpatient, um, and hospitals, community hospitals five years prior to that. So I just want to start out with just talking a, just a, a minute about what is occupational therapy. Um, some of you may know, some of you may have dealt with occupational therapists, uh, with your little ones. And there's a, there's a difference between PT and OT. Basically occupational therapy is anything we specialize in anything you do from the minute you wake up in the morning until the, the minute you go to bed at night. So that that is, think of what all that you do. You, you move from lying down to sitting up. Then you go from sitting to standing. And then you go to the bathroom. Maybe you brush your teeth, take a shower, um, get dressed, uh, eat breakfast, prepare breakfast, um, go to work, you drive, you have to figure out how to get there. You, your work involves many occupations. Um, so it's anything you do from the minute you get to work to the minute you get home, that can be getting coffee, making coffee, um, sitting at a computer, logging in, uh, depending on what you do, it could be basically anything. If it's auto mechanics, you got to be able to have that fine motor ability. You're using both sides of the body. You're using your eye hand coordination. If you're working with people, you got to have the social skills, the cognitive ability. Um, it just, the sky's the limit there. And then after work, you're driving home again. Maybe you're going to the grocery store. Maybe you're going to pay some bills. Maybe you're going to do the dishes. Anything you do in your day, is occupational therapy. And that's what we work with. With the little ones, we're gonna work with more of the development um, and play skills and um, reciprocal play, those types of things. But everything that goes into that development, even from the primary reflexes on. So the difference with physical therapy is um, their main focus, they, there's some overlap with transfers and things, but their main focus is walking. So walking, some transfers, although we do, all transfers because you can't get through your day without transferring. So um, that's just kind of a quick overview. All right, I wanna talk about the senses and everybody knows about the senses. There's sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. Those are pretty self-explanatory, um, but they're super, super important, each and every one of them. And I think with going through this pandemic that we've all experienced, some of us have gotten COVID. Those that have, have lost some have lost their smell and their taste. And 
I think those that have gotten had this side effect have really realized just how important taste and smell is. I have a coworker who um, she's in her thirties. She got COVID really bad. She'd had the vaccines, whether that's here nor there. Um, but she got it really bad. She was really sick for about three days, but, but she's still, this was months ago, five, six months ago. She still has lingering taste and smell uh, side effects. And what's interesting here, as we talk about the senses is she told me, she's like, you just don't realize how much we use those senses. She said, I can take a shower. And she said, I don't feel clean. I, I scrub and scrub and scrub and I do my hair but I, I'm not smelling the cleanliness of the shampoo and the soaps. And she said, I'm finding I'm in there longer because I, I can't smell when, when it's clean. She can feel, but she can't smell. And the other thing with smell is she's burning things. She can't smell when things are getting um, close to being done or when they're burning because um, her, her senses are screwed up. So they're all super super important. Um, and I know we're here talking about sight, huge sense, but these other ones, I can't stress enough just how important they are. Um, the touch, I did want to talk about touch real quick. Uh, our skin is our biggest organ, our biggest organ. There are, there's 20 square feet of, of skin on an adult. That's, that's a lot of skin. It gives us a tremendous amount of feedback of where we are in space and how we relate to our environment and other people. So huge. Um, and it protects us against immunity, vitamin protection, it regulates our temperature, um, permits sensation of touch, heat, and cold. So just wanted to mention those. You're all familiar with those. There's a couple more that you may or may not be familiar with, vestibular, proprioception, and interoception. So I'm just going to talk about each of these just a few minutes. Vestibular is your like sense of movement. So it's how you know, even with your eyes closed, that your body is sitting down or lying down or standing up or moving or turning. It's how you know with your eyes closed that if you put your hand up, you know where it is. If you flip it over, you know you're flipping it over. You're not using your vision in order to do that. That is your sense of this, that's your vestibular system telling you where you are in space. Uh, it's closely tied to vision, super closely tied to vision in the brain. And that's also very important, as you can imagine. So picture yourself in a car. You got a car next to you on your right and you're stopped. You look down to look at your phone or to grab a piece of gum and the car next to you starts to move. You feel like you're moving, too, even though your foot is on the brake. And sometimes you startle and you, you put that brake in down harder but you're not moving. It's that the vestibular system tricked your vestibular system into feeling like you moved. So that's uh, uh, the best example I can come up with, with uh, what the vestibular system is. It's also like the kids who get dizzy on roller coasters, they have a overreacted, overreactive vestibular system. Those that can go on 20 times on a roller coaster, underreactive vestibular. They need more vestibular to kind of do, they can take a lot of vestibular. Proprioception are your joints and your muscles. So that is where um, if you lift up a cup of coffee, for example, so you reach over and you lift it up, you can see with your vision, there's like half a cup of coffee left. But what you don't do is lift it up really fast and throw the coffee over your head. You know, by, by feeling the cup and by looking, how much pressure you need on that coffee cup and, and, or if there's nothing in it, I think we've all like lifted something we thought was heavy and it was super light. And we've kind of gone like this. That's our, our sense of proprioception. It's our muscles and our tendons telling us how heavy and how much effort we have to do in order to move something or lift something or, or hang on something. It, it's all of that feedback from our muscles and tendons. Our interoception, can't stress the importance of this one either. Um, interoception is everything, the word inter, that's inside our body, it's interoception. So it's, it's super important. Um, it's what tells us that we're hungry, tells us that we have to go to the bathroom, tells us we have an upset stomach, tells us our ears 
hurt. We have pain inside here, um, a headache, those types of sensation, constipation. That's a, that's a really bad pain. That's all introception. And when any of these are off, it, it affects everything. If, if you're not reading your interception um, feedback correctly or can't communicate it, that's, that's going to affect um, all sorts of things in daily life. So those are our senses. With low vision blindness, other senses may be heightened. So touch, smell, hearing, vestibular, proprioceptive, interoception, interoception um, including cognitive functions, um, can all be heightened. So think about that as you're thinking about your, your, your own kids and anyone with um, low vision or blindness. Fun fact, to keep visually impaired safe, those electric and hybrid vehicles, they no longer can stay quiet. As of September of 2020, all um, hybrid EV vehicles um, must be manufactured with sound at speeds of below 19 miles per hour. It'll be a high-pitched whine, but that is to help keep those with low vision and blindness safe. And of course, you're using your auditory sense because that is a little bit heightened and they're gonna be aware of that and they're gonna hear these cars. I thought that was pretty interesting. Another fun fact um, regarding colors, during the day, our eyes are most uh, easily able to pick up green light, followed by yellow and blue. So this is important when we're picking out our toys for our, our little ones, um, when we're uh, maybe painting a room or when you're designing an activity, you wanna kind of use that green light as much as possible, yellow and blue as well. We're gonna talk about contrasting colors later, but... Um, this was just an interesting, this is the reason why. And this is also the reason why traffic lights are green. Red is also used in traffic lights because it stands out against all the green in nature. So pretty, pretty cool. Otherwise, red is actually the least visible color. So I'm just going to go into stereognosis. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this term or not but it's the mental perception of depth or three-dimensionality of the senses, usually in reference to the ability to perceive the form of solid objects by touch. Remember that tactile system, 20 square feet of receptors in our skin. So super important, use this, use this with our kids who have low vision, it's, it's super important. And the best example I can come up with with this is um, a woman reaching into her purse. She's not looking, she's not using vision. She's reaching in and she's feeling around. She's using touch, she's using tactile. She can find her keys, she can find her makeup, she can find her, her pen. That's probably the easiest one I can come up with. Um, I can't come up with a, 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 a equally good um, example when it comes to men, you know, who don't typically have a purse, but I'm sure they can relate to that, just reaching in something, not being able to see it, whether it's a glove compartment or something in a car and reaching and um, identifying something by touch. We do this a lot with our kids. Um, and I, I can't stress this enough when you are working with your kids, um, utilize that sense of touch so they can be successful with that. So um, sensory bins are, are fantastic activities. You put objects in bins to feel, explore, step on. Don't, don't um, underestimate the feet. There's lots of um, sen sensory um, information that comes back from the, from the feet, um, sensory receptors. So you wanna find objects. This is just a small list. You can, you can think of others but rice, corn, feathers, noodles, water beads, bubbles, water, um, water, just plain water, sand. You can put um, a shaving cream, shredded paper, beans, all of those types of things uh, in bins. And if you want, you can use those like outside and then have them step in them, hold their hands so they, they don't fall because it's gonna feel fun. Anything that you do with your kids, I would strongly um, recommend that you do them with them that you experience these as well so you know how it feels and try to do it without that vision if you can close your eyes um, wear the glasses um, which is what we're going to do in a, in a minute here but just and then put objects in there that are um, motivating so you might you might put a plastic spoon and fork in there and then about 
about um, utensils. You might put their favorite character, Barney or whatever it might be, in and bury them in that stuff or give them a bath or cover them with shaving cream and help them find them. Great activity or utilizing that. Um, sense that tactile sense, which is wonderful. Tactile defensiveness, another big term, and I promise you, I think this is my last big term, is a term used to describe the reaction that occurs when someone is very sensitive or oversensitive to touch when compared to others. Often their skin is more sensitive to everyday thing, clothing, textures, temperature, and hair brushing, to name a few. And I mean over, overreactive. So this little girl touch any, it might be her clothes. It might be, but this is the type of reaction you would see if you're overreacted, overreactive to touch. Um, you're bothered by, by the tags in the back of your shirts. Baths could be the hot water, hot water, cool water. Try the different temperatures. Um, hugs can be, uh, can be too much for some kids, light touch, hitting others. So what happens sometimes is like, you'll have kids around other kids and they might um, brush up against each other. Kids are always in each other's space. They might swing out and hit the other kid because they're, they're super sensitive to that tactile touch. And to them, it felt like a punch. So they reacted, they kind of punched back. So it's important you understand that tactile system. If it's not completely intact, you can have this oversensitivity. Um, and for like haircuts, you can wear like tight hats, put them on really tight like a swim cap and drive to the beautician or the beauty shop and then take it off. It can make it less sensitive. That's just one little tip if you could do that. I did have a, a quick story about a little boy who was three years old with autism and he had a very strong overreact activity to touch and the tactile system could not get him into the bath or shower for nothing. Um, we tried everything, toys, music, special rewards, stickers, um, a visual schedule, favorite toys in there, rewards. Uh, we could not get him in the water at all. And finally, uh, we tried cool, look cool water, which you would think would be the worst thing you could try and jumped right in. No problem. He was oversensitive to that warm water. It probably felt way too hot to him. He needed that cool. So just a kind of a neat story. And then, and again, it's just a, a just like a, you can't stand it. I'll have these kids who will um, come home from preschool or the moms will tell me they come home or they, they cry when I try to get them dressed. They strip off their clothes. Whenever we get back from the grocery store, they can't stand anything by their their skin. There are some things an OT can work with you on with that um, to help decrease that sensitivity. If anybody has more questions on that, we could go more into that. But helpful tips for this, um, seamless clothing, clothing, and a lot of places are doing seamless clothing. Um, no surprise hugs. Approach from the front and give verbal foreshadowing. I'm, I'm calm. I can't wait. I'm coming over by you and I'm going to give you a big hug so they know you're coming. Firm touch, not light touch, that's worse. Remove clothing tags, you can do that too. Or buy them without the tags. Luke, cool bath water, I talked about that. Have them be the line leader or the caboose. Um, or just watch if you're at a daycare that that you let the caregivers know that they, they shouldn't be too close to another child because they're super sensitive to that tactile with that tactile system. And tight hat before a haircut I talked about. So here's where I want you to do that first activity. And I, I just want to hone into your awareness. I, I know there's only a few of us on today, but use your blindfold or glasses with Vaseline. Or if you want to just shut your eyes, that's fine too. Or maybe squint really, really tight. So it's your whole vision is obscured. It's the best I think would be glasses with Vaseline. And if you don't want to try it now, try it um, another time. But in school, when I went to college, we got a partner and it was one of our, one of many uh, awesome assignments, but we went around the whole university. We used a wheelchair, but we we're also low vision and we had um, eyeglasses with Vaseline and we were in pairs for safety reasons, of course. And we had to get around and do things like eating and drinking and brushing our teeth, that kind of thing. And it, it makes you acutely aware of what of your other senses and what your little ones are feeling, if if that makes sense. 
Um, so try eating or drinking. I'll give you a minute here. Try to eat or drink. Um, I, applesauce is a fun thing or scooping up milk with a spoon. Um, just challenge yourself a little bit, drink water. And I want you to think about what senses you're using, relying on, and how easy or hard the task is because of it. So I'll just give you a minute to try that. If you could, if you want to, I would really love it if you could share in the, um, in the chat. Great. So I hope you had a good time trying that. Uh, what I want you to do, like with the toothbrush and toothpaste, is try that again with those types of tasks. Obviously, be safe with anything that you do with low vision, with walking around or anything like that, because it is, it does, it is challenging. But anything that you do, play with some toys, do some, um, try writing something and just see how difficult that is. So that's kind of what I I want you to just get the idea of and think about what senses you're actually using and relying on because that's what your kids are going to rely on. So this you can do later um, and just think about those senses. So the just right challenge is super important when you're working with any kids, your own or anybody's. You want to, um, you want to, I think I have another. Yeah, it was uh, developed by that term was coined by A. Jean Ayers. She is an occupational therapist. Um, and it's basically just grading or adapting an activity to be not too difficult, that it feels unachievable, and not too easy that it's that it is um, not beneficial. So just if, if you're frustrating your, your kids at home, if they're getting frustrated, you knew you got to know, I mean, it could be tired, hungry, rule those out, I have to go to the bathroom, rule those needs out but it could be that you're just asking too much. The challenge is too great. So try to grade that challenge and bring it down a little bit. Make it easier. Make, make it successful. You don't want them too successful or they're going to be like, oh, this is easy. And they're not going to ever want that challenge. So you have to do this with every activity you have. Just try to kind of find that just right challenge. All right. I'm going to go through the developmental norms. And again, this is important um, because you might be expecting your toddler um, or baby to be um, already standing or already um, able to bring a Cheerio to his mouth or hold the bottle. Um, and you might be, again, asking too much. So it's just important to kind of have an idea on how the development is supposed to go. Um, just remember, every child's different. Start where they are. Um, they're all unique and they grow at their own individual pace. And some will have what we call splinter skills. <coughs> Excuse me. They, they might be able to do, they might be able to stand up, but they can't hold their bottle yet or use a spoon. Or um, as they get older, they might be not toilet trained, but they're doing something like pulling on their pants or pull, getting undressed, you know, things that aren't quite in this order, but so they might be like this, but this is in general. And try not to compare. It's really hard. You're, you're in play group. Try not to compare. We just remember every child's different. They're developing at their own pace. So six to nine months, um, they're starting to feed themselves finger foods. Typically, they're able to pull off those socks. This little one is a fisted grip. So that's perfectly normal at that age. Nine to 12 months, they're drinking from a sippy cup. They're cooperating with dressing and undressing. So holding out their arms, that kind of thing. And they're drinking from an open cup held by an adult. Um, hand over hand assist can help these things. Like, um, so like that would be with holding the cup. That would be an example of hand over hand assist. And if they're not drinking from a sippy cup yet, you're going to, you're going to help hold that. Um, but, but don't just do it. Put their hand under yours and put, I mean, I can't do it really on the screen, but have your hand over theirs. So they're getting that movement. They're getting that proprioceptive input. They're also getting some tactile input in order to help them learn some of these tasks. Oh, and colorful socks and get them on the belly as much as you can. These, the, these little ones, get them on their belly because I know we're putting them to sleep on, on their back. I can, it can't be said enough to get them on their belly when they're out playing. They're working on that extension pattern. They're working on that, bringing that head up. Whatever vision they do have, they're able to look around the room. So that's pretty important too. 12 to 18 months, um, right around a year, they're starting to stir with a spoon. Not well. Don't expect that. 
just the stirring. They can use a straw, typically. Um, they attempt to, they can attempt to wash their face, hands, again, not very well. Um, they can start using an open cup independently. Um, put just a few tips here. If they're not using a straw yet and you want to help them, use a short straw. You can try different size straws. There's also one-way straws you can get through like Amazon. They have a valve in them. So a parent can suck up the liquid, use a favorite liquid. So, so it's motivating. The parent can suck up the liquid. And then when you let go of the straw, it's there, the, the liquid. So it's right at the top of the straw. And then when your toddler tries to suck on it, they can get a taste of it. And we want them to get their lips around it. And then they can start sucking and, and learn the motion. So those are just some tips on helping. You can also drain it into their mouth with a straw. You can put your suck it up, put your finger over it, and then kind of drip it into their mouth just so they can start feeling the straw and kind of get used to that if they have any oral motor issues. Um, allow them to chew on straws, experiment, um, use baby jars. Baby jars are the perfect size for little hands. So if you have some leftover baby jars, use them, fill them halfway with um, milk, water, maybe something motivating. I'm, I, water's the best thing, but it's not always motivating to start with and go about halfway way full. And it's a perfect little size for little hands and they can feel really cool and successful because they can hold this cup by themselves. Um, blowing bubbles through a straw or cotton balls is also another uh, thing you might try if you're having any oral motor um, weakness. So that would be something we would do in occupational therapy, for example. 18 to 24 months, um, they can remove their jacket shirt. They can put on simple clothing. They can use a spoon. And I want you to look at this little guy holding his spoon. He's not holding it perfectly. That's all right. That's that's great with where he's at. But his other hand's up here. He's working super hard. He's using his eyes. He's using his proprioception. He's using his tactile sense. He's He's trying so hard to get it up here. This hand just is out there kind of trying to hold that body in place to stabilize that core. So that's kind of what you see when you're looking at this little guy who's working so hard to get that spoon to his mouth. 24 to 30 months, right around two years, they can take off their shoes, socks, and loose pants. They can sit on a toilet for a minute. Maybe not successful, but they're able to sit just like mom and dad. They think they're awesome. Um, they can wash, dry dry their hands and face, and they can use a fork to start to stab. If you're trying to work with these skills and they're not quite there yet, say there's a three-year-old and they're having trouble stabbing, could be that low because of the low vision, but then use um, contrasting colors. So if you can find something dark, say, say um, grapes cut up, they're green, so they'd be, they're light green, but then use it against a, a white plate or maybe a black plate might work or something darker food. So make sure you're contrasting colors and your vision, you're thinking about that vision, um, but also do the hand over hand with them. Show them how to, to, to move that motion if you're working on, on stabbing. Stabbing is a hard skill. 30 to 36 months, they can pour liquid with some help. Daytime, you're in control with accidents. Brushes teeth independently, not well but they can start to brush them. So they're gonna need a parent to be thorough. 36 to 42, three years, they can manipulate large buttons and snaps. This is a fine motor skill. We want that pincher grasp we're looking for. Strength, um, it takes tactile sense. It takes um, that eye-hand coordination and those bilateral skills of using both hands together. Hard skill. Again, you think of those contrasting colors with the button. There's a green button on yellow. That's a pretty good contrast. 42 to 48, they can dress themselves, not shoelaces. That doesn't come in till kindergarten, first grade, and it's a super difficult skill. Uh, serve, they can serve themselves at the table and fasten the seatbelt. I'd highly recommend, I talk about this later, but I'd highly recommend if you can, family style dinners, especially if you have picky eaters or um, they're having trouble with um, tactile, maybe gag reflex, those types of things. And it's just really great for social. And I know we're all busy, but even if you could make a goal of once a week where you're going to do family style and everybody passes the, 
the bowl. You've got a, your, your sense of proprioception, you're grabbing the bowl, you're holding it. Now you've got to hold it with one hand and scoop with the other. Even young little ones can do this and they feel super important. You can assist them if you're worried about them dropping it, but they feel like they're just doing what the family's doing and they're getting exposed to everything, the, the smells, hopefully the tastes, and they're getting all of those skills. I just say one teaspoon, one teaspoon of something. If they don't want to eat those green beans or those peas or carrots or whatever it might be, just everybody puts a teaspoon on their plate. So they're getting exposed to that as that food comes by. They're starting to um, fasten their seatbelt. 48 to 54 months, four years, they know which shoe goes on which foot. That sometimes takes a while as well. Um, another little trick that I do for those older kids who aren't quite getting that is I'll like, if these are the shoes, I'll put a dot right on the inside of this shoe and I'll put another dot over here. You could use puffy paint or glue also so they can feel it as well. 54 to 60 months, uh, toilets, wipes self, flushes, redresses. Again, maybe not perfect. Maybe they're getting that shirt on inside out but they're putting it on. So praise them. Great job. Um, and then teach them where the, where the tag is to feel the tag. If, if there's a tag on there um, or where the back of the collar is, those types of things to figure out how to put those clothes on correctly. They can comb and brush their hair, brush teeth. Again, probably not super thoroughly. You're probably going to need to do a thorough job as a parent, but you can do hand over hand for that. Um, and they could make Again, not perfect, but they can do it. 60 to 72, around five years of age, they can make a simple breakfast, lunch. Simple being like peanut butter, like the little girl down in the right-hand corner. She's making that peanut butter sandwich. She's got the peanut butter right in the middle of the bread. She probably isn't going to get it out to the sides. That's okay. She's making her own sandwich. Um, you can teach her to cut that off, it, the crust off. That would be really fun for her, um, but really great to encourage that independence. Um, using a knife for spreading and taking a shower or a bath under supervision, of course. Um, get up and move, take a stretch, take care of you. Um, you are the most important person for your child. Um, you are their advocate. You are, you are the one for them, but you are going to be at your best if you take care of you, if you take a break. Today you're learning. That's great. Hopefully you can take some of these tips away today. Um, but take care of you, stretch, move, um, run to the bathroom. This will be recorded so you can catch what you missed. Um, it's, it's important that you take care of you. All right, tips and tricks. Um, more, I guess I should say. So we're going to start with those independent living skills. And we're going to start with feeding, bright lighting, um, contrasting colored cups, bowls, plates from uh, the table color. So if your table color is brown, use white plates, but then try to get food that's a little more colorful on the plate. Those types of, be trying to think of those types of things. Uh, clock method, um, which I, I think is probably going away because not many of us have, we all have digital clocks now or watches, um, but simple directions, up, down, right, left, top, bottom. If you're trying to teach these directions, Grab their arms, use that sense of proprioception and tactile and hold their arms up or out in front of you, which would be which would be up on the plate and teach up and then down or up, down this way. Um, and then right, have them have them move with your hands over their hands. So you're touching, use that tactile. It's super important. And then if you're moving them, it's that it's that um, proprioceptive sense. Teach directions, use big movements. I will start with those and our hand over hand. I mentioned that tippy cups, tippy cups, magnetic cups. They have the magnetic cups with the magnet on the bottom that um, it, it sort of suctions like to the table top, but it's super cool. Um, you also have to use a little bit more force to get it that can work on that strength, but you're not going to tip it over as much. Put, put them like half full. So if you do have a mess, no big deal. If they tip it over, no big deal. Just say, whoops, unless they consistently do that, then they're playing a game, but, um, and that's different. So the easy peasy happy mats, that's what's up here in the right-hand um, corner of the slide. 
you can get all sorts of these. They're about $20. There's different versions. You don't have to get easy peasy, but this is an example of one. And then it's the, the mat and the plate, as you can see, is all one unit. I really like these. They're micro microwavable. Um, they're, they're not, I don't know if they're microwavable. They're dishwasher safe. And the child doesn't have to work so much. And it's always a happy smile. And you can have different things in different compartments. So it's they're pretty kind of cool if you aren't for them. Um, I talked about the baby bird. Baby bottle jar, perfect size, and filling them half full or quarter full. Um, oh, eating with your eyes and your expression. Just So we eat with our eyes, that expression. So if you've got somebody with low vision or um, blindness, you want to describe what that food looks like. Um, big, um, big, um, juicy watermelon pieces, bright red juicy watermelon pieces, make it sound good. A food f eating should be fun. It, it is, it is a social time. It is a fun time. I know we're busy. Try to sit down, try not to multitask. That's like difficult to do in our day and age, but do what you can to sit down with them and have fun. And when they're successful, praise them, clap, applaud. Um, they will, feeding time can be so much fun. It can be messy too and put something over them or, or strip them down into their diapers and just sit them in that high chair and let them be messy and let them have fun. Feeding should be fun. We don't want them tense. The more anxious you are um, as, a, as a, the person sitting there as a child, the, the more your system shut down, your, your interoception shuts down. It, it, think of yourself, um, uh, uh, you're walking on a path and a grizzly bear comes out. The last thing you want to do because you're super heightened, you're super anxious, is everything inside shuts down. Your digestion set shuts down. If you were hungry before, you're not hungry now. You're not thinking about your stomach or going to the bathroom or anything. You're thinking about getting out of there. So you want feeding time to be happy, relaxing, fun time as much as possible anyway in our day and our, our world today. Watching a video of a young children eating if they don't have the privilege of being in like daycare or settings where they can watch others and enjoying their food. I'm always going yum, 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 yum. I'm big expression, um, high voice, and I can get kids to eat lots of things just from, from that type of using those expressions and voice. Family style dinner. I have talked about that. Kids copy, especially mom and dad. Be sure you are enjoying your food and meals in front of them. Noises exaggerate. If they see you take a taste of something and go, ooh, there probably is no way you're going to get that child to eat that food or maybe any of the food because they're not sure which food you didn't like. So just be, be aware of what you're doing. Keep kitchen items and food in the same places within reach those things that you want them to be able to reach, salt and pepper, maybe the, the, the forks, the drawers, those types of things, glasses, their, their cups. Keep items on the table in the same spots. That'll just help them be more successful. Expose kids to taste, smells, textures, foods as early as possible. Encourage playing with foods, a uh, sense of smell, touch is heightened and have them pass food around. And I talked about that, put a small teaspoon on their plate to expose them to that smells, touch and texture. Um, I was going to mention something with exposing them, but Terry, can I add something right here? Yeah, go ahead. Um, what I've noticed when working with little ones, um, mm -hmm. that if they're very defensive um, with a food, if you have them play with the food with their feet first, eventually they end up playing with their hands, and then it ends up to their mouth. Great, great point and tip. Yes, that, those, those feet are super important. They're also far away from our body, so they're going to be a little bit braver to maybe touch with those feet first. It's, it's important. You might, yeah, it might be messy for a while, but it, I promise you it'd be, it'll be worth it. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, great idea. Great idea. I don't know what I was going to add in there, but maybe it'll come to me. 
Um, and this just goes along with those picky eaters. Um, what you were a good segue. Mix foods that they like with new foods. So you might you, they might like chocolate milk. You can get them to eat cereal, and then you can slowly add white milk to the chocolate milk and get them onto the white milk. Yogurt with fruits. You can mix those real slow. You can grind them up so they hardly know they're there and then gradually increase that texture. Ketchup, you'll, you'll have these kids who only like ketchup and ranch dressing. They won't really eat much of anything else, but some foods they'll eat with that. Well, let them have it with everything. And then you can slowly taper off the ketchup and the ranch dressing, or they might, lots of adults still use it today, but you can, you can use it to get them to use, eat other foods and then praise them. Yay. How exciting is this? Um, add water to juice a little at a time to keep diluting it until it's only water, especially in the bottle. You really got to worry about the um, teeth with, um, if you're having them with juice all the time, if they're super picky eaters and you're worrying about those calories, sometimes you have to do that, but, but try to make sure it's never at night. Just keep diluting it until it's only water. Um, and and get maybe bottles that are see-through so they can't see any color that might help um, family style dinners okay on to hygiene and grooming and bathing start early oh i do know what i was going to say about the feeding picky eaters when my kids were young all i did was took um whatever we ate for dinner and i would grind that up in the blender Put that in, add some milk or formula, depending on the age of the of my child at the time, and then put it in the ice cube trays and freeze it. And then I had vegetables and I had beef, venison. I was feeding them whatever we had for dinner, whatever we had left over, I would throw in there and um, I'd have these in the ice cube trays. And it was perfect because even from like whenever they started eating six months, I was starting to expose them to all sorts of foods. So try to start as early as possible. If you haven't started already, it's okay. Start, start now. So, um, hygiene, grooming, bathing, same thing. Start early. Um, bath, try bubbles. If they, if they're, if you're having trouble getting them into the bath, try bubbles, bathroom crayons, paints, smells such as bath bombs, smell and sound. Again, we're trying to bring in all of those senses that as many as we can, sometimes it's too much. Sometimes you might have the radio going in the bathroom and that's what is too much for them. So experiment with all of those types of things. Um, music that's only for bath time. It might be their favorite Disney CD um, or, or song that is just for bath time. If you're having trouble getting them in there, if not, it, it doesn't matter so much. Bath toys saved only for the bath time, warm, cool water. You can try differences. Brushing teeth, brush with hand over hand assist. So get, they get that feel, that proprioception um, input. Vibrating toothbrushes. You can try regular, you can try vibrating um, and just have them hold the, the toothbrush. Start slow if they're sensitive at all. Um, gentle brushing of the tongue, starting at the tip, suck on icicles, popsicles, not too far back if they have like an overreactive gag reflex, or even if they don't, you don't want to go too far back and start that. Dentist, try mock dental exams, including leaning back. So when, when we lean back, when we're exposed, when we're on our back, it's a super vulnerable position. And if you have any kids that are worried already or a little bit anxious, the last thing they want to be is leaning back in a chair and exposed. Again, think of that scenario with the bear. If we would fall down and there's a bear or other, any other animal, we, we close up, we flex, we tuck in because we're protecting all of the vital organs. Same thing when we're anxious, we tend to curl up. We don't, we don't go, oh, here, I'm fine. This is what we do when we're relaxed and trusting. So before the dentist, have them come with you. If you have another person, if you're lucky enough to have another person that can come with you or an older child while you're at the dentist, great. If it's your only time away, okay, maybe just take a picture of you in the dentist chair and you could show it that way or describe it. Otherwise, play at home. You can sit down in a chair. You can look in their mouth, have them open it, count their teeth, use a little um, wooden stick and count a touch on their teeth. So they get that input, um, to get them used to just being ready to go to that dentist. It is a scary place for kids, especially 
Oh, use a flashlight. That's also fun. And, and kids would be able to see that you're, you're doing something with the flashlight. Um, have them be the dentist, have them count your teeth, have them look at your tongue. Uh, those types of things, books, uh, you can read them books. You can bring them to the dentist, um, vibrating toothbrush. On to dressing, um, loose, comfortable clothing. If you're working on them getting dressed, sweatpants, um, get clothing a size bigger or use the clothing that they're going to be wearing next year so that they can practice putting on those clothes to make it easier, make them successful. You're looking for that just right challenge. Sweatpants are great. Buttoning, a little trick with buttoning. Uh, when, if you have uh, jeans, when they eventually get into jeans or even jeans is probably the best thing it works with because you can take and just cut. I wish I had my jeans here, but you can cut and it's like a, it's like an eighth of an inch with scissors and you cut on the inside of the jeans and that button will slide right through. It slides so much easier. So remember that, especially as your kids start to get older. But you could do that with anything. You just don't want to do that with um, clothing that can rip easily. Um, zipping, you can use a key ring, put that on the zipper to make zipping easier, going up and down, make them independent, and then take it off as they get a stronger um, pinch and a stronger ability to be independent in that task. Children's book about dressing themselves. Again, praise them, applaud. Um, and then I listed some stores that have clothing without seams if you're having any tactile defensiveness, and I put more in the references. Target has adaptive sensory friendly um, clothing, including uh, children with disabilities and sensory sensitivities, tagless, 100% cotton, flat seams. Hanes has some seamless clothing options. Under Armour has seamless, expensive, but they last longer. Fruit of the Loom, um, some seamless, lightweight. Google it, they're all over. Uh, you'll find stuff on Amazon, Walmart, The Gap. They have a super collection, super soft, lightweight. A um, lot of seamless, as you can see, lightweight, um, super soft, elastic, cuddly duds, Amazon. All right, to mention that. Toileting. Um, toileting's a, a, a tough thing for all parents. Um, positioning is super, super important. So if you're having any trouble with, with toileting, start with positioning. You want them to feel safe and secure. Again, go back to my example of if you're anxious or worried or something is coming at you like a bear, the last thing you want to do is go to the bathroom. You're not even, your body shuts right down. Even if you had to go to the bathroom before the bear came, you don't have to anymore. It, it, your, your body just shuts down. It's a protective um, mechanism. And, and where it goes is to your extremities, all the blood, so you can run and get safe again. So if you're if you're working on toileting with these little ones, being on a tall toilet where your legs are dangling and you're having trouble balancing and you're afraid of falling, the last thing you are going to be able to do is void successfully or have a bowel movement. It's just not going to happen. So make sure they're safe. They feel safe and secure. It's a happy place. You can get toilet inserts so that fits them better. You, they don't want to be worried about falling in as well. Make sure their feet are supportive, supported. Um, smaller toilet bowls you can get. You can buy the small um, toilets. Arm support would be great, um, even because you're right there. It would really, it kind of closes you in and makes you feel safe. Think 90, 90, 90. That's 90 degrees at your hips, 90 degrees at your knees, and 90 degrees at your ankles. Gary, can I mention something quick? Of course. Yep. So one thing that with parents um, that are here or could be watching this video later um, that they could get away with at the home is letting their child explore all areas of the toilet. Of course, you wouldn't want to do that in public, like at the schools, um, but right. kids need that that hands-on experience before you expect them to do a task with it? Yes, that again, that going to that tactile sense, um, just being able to touch it and, and get an idea of what it is and how big it is and how tall it is using that tactile sense. Absolutely, absolutely. And at home, yeah, we don't want them out somewhere else where it's dirtier. 
Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a really, a really good point. Um, and then they could, they can also feel the little ones, the ones that you buy and can put out in your living room. Um, they can, they can feel those, what they are and what kind of a chair it is and how they need to sit on that. So they're, they're learning. This little guy's got a book, um, looking at pictures. He's got a, an insert in the toilet. Um, feet are dangling, but he seems okay. There's actually, if you look on the picture between his legs, there's actually a stool behind him. They're not using it. Maybe they used it before, after he, and, and you, you have those inserts. You can have the child go get the inserts. They, if, they should always be in the same place, like I mentioned before, and they know where they go. There's all sorts of stories about kids playing in toilet water. It happens. That's with any child. They're, they're figuring out their environment. Um, so it's you don't want them in there, but it happens. This little guy is perfect. 90, 90, 90. He can explore this. He can, he can sit on this, um, read a book or play with a toy. Um, anything that's just kind of getting him used to. He's fully clothed. He's just getting the idea. He's just getting used to sitting on it. This little one is um, has a really wide toilet seat. It looks like there might be an insert in there or she's leaning forward enough where she doesn't fall in, um, but she's got her feet supported. So making her feel nice and safe, those steps. <coughs> Excuse me. Toilet, um, toileting continued. Cheerios, Fruit Loops for boys um, to aim. Think of contrasting colors. So Fruit Loops might be better in this case. Cheerios, you're not going to see as well. Um, or you can always give them these afterwards or stickers, anything like that. Um, and I've got some great stickers for later that are Braille, if you haven't already found those somewhere. But I have the reference for those later. Outside play without um, diapers, pull-ups. Those are just great ways um, to have them out there if you live in, an, uh, like in the country, someplace where they can run around without their diapers and pull-ups. They need to be able to feel that they're voiding. Uh, the, our diapers and pull-ups today, super absorbent, super absorbent. Um, they, they don't even feel wet. So they're, they're really not getting that tactile feedback. And it's so important. Um, you can put underwear between the skin and the diaper or the pull-up. Because of that, that will help them feel that wetness. I wouldn't start doing this till you start seeing signs uh, that, they're, that they're ready to start toileting. And those signs would be... Um, looking funny when they're, when they're voiding, going behind the chair to, or in a corner to have a BM, those types of signs. Um, cloth diapers, that will help that, that tactile system will know exactly when they are wet and cheer, cheer when they void outside or in the toilet, you did it, you went to the bathroom. Um, it's a great, it's a great, you want them to be proud of themselves. I don't know if I went down. Uh, okay, watching videos, if that's an option. Bring other, um, bring kids into the bathroom where you are so you can be the example. Um, use potty seats in the living room or wherever is easier and within sight or within ability to be able to feel them and toilet inserts. Uh, footstool to support the feet on a regular toilet, books, music, toys when sitting on the toilet. You can save that those for just when you're in the bathroom. Put your BM um, from the diaper, um, put it into the toilet and let them see this. It's, it's important because sometimes kids know something came out of them and they think it's a part of them. And they're really anxious about, I just lost a part of me. And you want them to know that this is normal, natural, all good, and then have them help you flush it down. Some kids get anxious because you just flushed a part of them down the toilet. So you want to just reassure them, be aware that that might be something that's causing them worry or anxiety, have them do the flusher. They can hear it. Uh, it's something that they can be comfortable with. Noiseless earphones. If they're scared of the flushing, give them control. Noiseless earphones you can get from, um, I think Walmart even has them. Amazon has them. You can find them online, but they also give some compression. So with that, it can be really calming. So it might not so much be the auditory as it just relaxes them a little and puts some pressure on their head. Uh, run water in the faucet while going to the bathroom. It can help them void. 
This mom's giving this little girl a high five, way to go. This one brought her, the one in the top left brought her stuffed animal um, along with her that makes her feel comfortable. She's got her stuffed animal who's also learning. So that's great. The same with the one, the little boy down on the bottom right, his little buddies there learning to go to the bathroom also. Um, this little one obviously is in the toilet. Like I was saying, kids love to explore and learn their environment. And she obviously is doing that. This little one is sitting backwards. Think outside of the box too with kids. You don't, it doesn't have to be always straight and forward and perfect. And oh, they're, they turned three. So now they should be doing this. Kids are anything, anything but what you expect. So this is great. Hopefully that's a washable marker, but I would washable marker and I would let them play on the back of the toilet because um, they're going to learn to sit and be comfortable. And he's got a toilet insert. So that's great. And I'm assuming mom is right there for safety reasons. I just want to touch base a little bit on constipation. You, um, if you have any trouble with this, with your little ones, you want to encourage movement, encourage liquids, fruits and vegetables. I have a handout with more natural ideas to help um, constipation. If anyone is interested, um, it's just one page. And what I can do, um, it's hard to do this with this thing. Oh, there we go. Um, this is... Uh, it's just a one page, lots of water, 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 ginger, you know, there's just some, some examples. If anybody is interested in that, I'm going to put, I'm going to copy and paste this link and put it in the, <clears throat> put it in the chat. I think you're in the way of my chat, but I'll do it after the, I'll do it after the presentation. So, um, where was I? All right. Uh, bathing. Try loop cool water. That's one option to try. We think about that tactile sense. If you're having any problems, if you're not having any problems with bathing, you can use these just to make it more fun for the kids, some of these, but um, uh, otherwise I think you're you're fine. But if you're having any problems, try some of these. Special bath toys that are only used in the bath. This is a, um, on the bottom right, that's a bath seat. Uh, that you can suction to the side so it's not going to move so they can feel safe and secure in there. Uh, that's that's something that can help. Bath crayons, tactile, vision, special music for bath time, auditory, toys that make noise, auditory. There's bath scents. She's got bath markers, those types of things. If you have a sibling, have them bathe together. That's fun. Those are the noiseless earphones I was talking about earlier in the top right. But with haircuts, sometimes if you're having trouble with haircuts, uh, it's um, it's the auditory sense and you can use those noiseless earphones and that can sometimes help. Older kids, uh, I've used um, ear plugs that has worked really well and they don't feel as con as conspicuous. So you can also use those as an option. Have the the child use the razor or the scissors on another family member. I usually think of another brother or dad who's, who's willing to get his hair just cut a few little snips under guidance of someone else. So um, he can be like, oh, see, I did it. Way to go. This is what getting your hair cut is. No big deal. They can also, they have those Play-Doh. Uh, little Play-Doh haircut things you can push down in the Play-Doh and it's a little person and all the hair comes out. It's great for tactile. It's great for, and use the, think of the contrasting colors and you can have them use scissors and cut that hair off and they're getting a haircut or you can demonstrate they're getting a haircut. They're happy. They look great. Those types of things. You can go from scissors to razors or, or back and forth let them hold the razor so they can get used to that noise and have the feel of it in their hand, that tactile. Um, watch videos of kids getting their haircuts or read stories about it. Suckers, special toys. Flowbee, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of a Flowbee, but um, it's an attachment that goes onto your vacuum cleaner. And I would like you to watch it uh, just for a few seconds here because it's, so interesting. It's fairly expensive. You might be able to find cheaper brands or used brands. 
Um, so I've got my essay written and I've been working on it for about a week. So now I'm going to show you how I use Grammarly. To so I'm going to show you how flow will be. Okay. And it attaches to your vacuum. This video is going to be a little bit loud. So I'm not going to talk during it, but there's different attachments. There's different attachments you can use and you start the vacuum. This, this little boy obviously is used to it. This little boy looks to be about nine months old. I would put him at, um, and he does a great job and you can, the attachments you can put on this flow bee. And I would only use this if you're having difficulty with haircuts as another option, you can use different attachments so you can get the hair shorter or leave it longer and just cut the ends off. So I, I think it's anywhere from a quarter inch to, uh, to three inches. There's different attachments that come with it. All right, I'm just gonna play a few minutes of this. Light on. So that's a flow bee, um, just a quick example of that. And it, that little guy was obviously used to it, but it, it kind of felt good to him. I've used one of these on uh, one of my kiddos, a young kiddo, two to three. And it was the only way his mom could get him to get a haircut. Uh, otherwise, he wouldn't let anybody near him. And the other advantage of this is the vacuum sucks the hair up. So nothing's going to land on their skin which might be a reason why some kids, it's that tactile system overreactive. They don't want anything touching their skin, especially that light touch. So just another option. Uh, wear a high, tight hat. I talked about that a little bit. Really tight, like maybe before you get your hair cut. Even a, a tight stocking cap might be effective. It just decreases that the tactile sensation a little bit where you could might be able to get through the haircut. I've also had um, parents cut hair uh, while they're sleeping or fingernails. Same type of thing. Mock haircuts, um, act, practice it out. Pretend you're at the beauty shop, sit in the chair up where it's time for your haircut. Cut, 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 cut. Oh, you did a great job. You get a sticker and you're done. Just to kind of get them used to it if they are nervous. Okay, fun tactile activities, favorite games. Fine motor skills, uh, high contrast colors, black, white, shapes, coloring. Um, Vibrating, light up toys, hold the switch down. Um, that's going to use more of the fine motor skills when you're holding that switch down. A light box, if you haven't used one, it's just a box that has a lighted background. That's pictures of it in the top left and in the bottom right and in the top right. That's from a light box. In finger painting, they can experiment. They can see better because that light is coming up through. Apps uh, for iPads and iPhones like Tap and See Now, There's a, there is a free version. And Little Bear Sees, I'm going to give examples of those on the next slides. Contrasting colors, use with um, the lights off to even make it um, more visible. High contrast coloring activity. Um, you can, if you're working on coloring and shapes, make sure you're using like that black background. So I put it on the brown background. It's not quite as, doesn't quite stick out as well as if you're going to use it on a black background. So kind of keep that stuff in mind when you are, when you're making and designing tasks and doing activities. Oh, I think I went too far. This is Little Bear Seas, Tap and See Now. And you can see just a really bright, vibrant pink with that giraffe. So it's a, it's designed more for um, cortical vision in, in involvement, but um, I would think it would be really great for anybody. I've used it with lots of low vision as well. Puffy paint, puffy paint. So this was the puffy paint that you guys um, all got. This is great. It dries quickly. Um, you can, let's see, you can do shapes uses an outline, fill it in completely. So here's an example of, I have a picture on this on my next slide too, but, but I filled these triangles in completely and square and circle. I did an outline of a square. I, you can work on emotions. 
sad face and then you can have them touch your face. Um, plus these are just pre-writing uh, another, uh, another shape, another shape, and then happy face for emotions. If you want to work on that, uh, you can start writing um, letters. You can write their names. You could play games with this, but it's really tactile. It's an awesome activity. Using it on cereal boxes is a great idea. Um, the sky's the limit. Using it on shoes to get them to be able to match the, the dots so they don't have shoes. Tic-tac-toe, that type of thing. This isn't very high contrast. So this is blue with gray. Can you see the, the difference here on how which one's easier to see? So um, be thinking of that when you're using the puffy paint or any activities. You can use it as a baseline. Once they get starting to like write their name, you can use it as you bring that pencil down and you're hitting that baseline. So they're writing on a line. That's another great idea with puffy paint. So then I just included these samples. With puzzles, um, try think think all of your senses. So think sound, shapes, tactile, um, animals, letters, numbers. These are, this puzzle on the left has tactile uh, different textures when you take the moose out and the fox out. So you can feel the different textures in there. And then when you, you gotta be able to feel the 3D puzzle in order to match the shape. Same with the sh simple shapes on the top right. I really like that one on the top right. It's um, those, those colors really stick out. You could put those on a black background also that might even make it stick out more black paper behind it. And then you have the 3D shapes um, box on the bottom right. Puzzles. Um, these are some great puzzles. This is Melissa and Doug puzzles, but there's lots of puzzles out there that are similar. What I don't like about this one is it's not high contrast. But what I do like about it is you're using your auditory sense. So when you, and tactile. So when you feel the shape, you put that sheep in there, it's going to say, it's going to say a sheep sound. Ba ba. Same with the dog, same with the horse. So it's, it's fun, it's interactive. Um, you're using more your tactile and your auditory sense versus any vision there, but that's still great. You're learning a lot. Um, these are some fine motor activities that's gonna use those tactile sense, sense more. Button stacking on the left, it's in Play-Doh. You can have them make the Play-Doh, stir the Play-Doh. You make Play-Doh at home, add, I have this later, but add, um, I talk about Play-Doh. I'll tell you that one later. So this is more with the throw, putting those buttons on, trying to, and it's spaghetti sticks, but you could use any types of sticks and loading those buttons on. So you're feeling for the buttons. Use high contrast. I don't particularly like that background. I would use more of a white background with all those colors. Um, I think they'd be able to maybe use a little bit of their vision maybe and tactile sense. This button activity on the right is, he's just sewing buttons on with, uh, thread, a needle and thread, which you can get those bigger needles. And he's using red yarn and brightly colored buttons on a yellow background, which is good for contrast. This is another one to help with buttoning. It's a paper plate with a slit in it and you're putting the button through and bringing it through the other way. It'll help with learning that buttoning task and getting that more mature pincer grasp. And you're using bilateral because he's holding the plate and pushing the button through and back. So it's a great little activity. Feed the dog is just another fine motor game. You can find, I just encourage you when you're out there looking for games to think about all of the senses, to think about age appropriate, of course, Contrasting colors. Um, this one's working on pincer grasp. The bones are pretty good uh, contrast with the colors, but you could even paint the inside of that black and it, they might show up a little bit better. Or I would put a black piece of paper behind the dog. So when you're pushing it through that white mouth, you kind of can see that opening a little bit more and then it can go through with the paper. And then you're working on pincer grasp. You can even use your fingers to start and then move to this as they get a little bit older. Uh, or you could color the bones black. That would be another idea. Um, Play-Doh. So I, I was going to mention this with making your own Play-Doh. You don't have to buy Play-Doh if you don't want to. Make your own. Encourage them to help stir and, and make and pour. Um, making things is so, it has so many developmental 
tasks in there and it's interactive and it's fun. What I like to do with Play-Doh is I like to add things like scents or pop rocks would be great. You can, it gives it a tactile and then you're also going to get some auditory for a little while while those rocks are popping. Very fun. You can also make your own uh, slime. You can make all sorts of tactile fun stuff that they can play in. Play sand, kinetic sand. There's lots of stuff on the market. A lot of this stuff you can, you can start to make now and get your own recipes for. Tactile stickers, I mentioned those before. I love these. Um, you can get them through the American Printing House. They have the alphabet reward stickers. These are all Braille and they're they're just, I just thought they were very cool for, for these kids, especially as they're learning Braille. Uh, thank you. I, I want to thank you so much for coming. I want to thank you for listening, spending part of your Saturday with me. Uh, I hope you could take away something for the, from this and that you learned something. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take some now. Carrie, this was amazing. There are so many resources in this PowerPoint in your presentation. I'm, it was great. I'm glad. Thanks. I, I hope so. I, I hope. I, I just, even if there's one or two takeaways, I, I hope someone can use some of this information. Oh, I myself got tons of takeaways that I can share oh, with good. families. Great. Tons. This is amazing. And I'm going to keep your PowerPoint for a reference. For Great. Until I'm done, until I'm retired. That's for sure. Please, please. <laughs> My email is on here as well. I, on the very bottom of the references, if anybody wants to reach out to me that way, I'd be happy to, to respond as well. There's no questions in the chat so far. Does anybody have a question that they want to ask Terry out loud or a personalized question at all? I did add that link that from that constipation page, it should work. I hope it works. Let me know if it doesn't, um, if anybody's interested in that, but just some other yep. ideas that you can use. It does work. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, no questions so far in the chat. So it looks like you covered everything very thoroughly. And I love that. This is amazing. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank you for having me. I, I, like I say, if, if there's anything else you need or um, any questions on anything, hopefully, hopefully there were some takeaways. So, yeah, I know there was. Uh, remember next weekend I have uh, for the preschool conference, there is another family connection, uh, the last family connection. And then the session I'm doing on behaviors. So Ooh, um, great. Yep. Don't be afraid to join next weekend. Uh, if you didn't get signed up for it, let me know and I'll make sure that you get the link for it. Yeah, thank you. I've been watching some of them recorded, which has been really nice, you know. Yep. In the live binder, there's the, the link that takes you to all the recordings for the preschool conference. So even great. if you didn't sign up for a session, uh, you can still go to that link and still get the recording. The only ones we don't record are like the family connection. We don't record that. Um, but, and at the end of the conference, uh, we will um, send out an evaluation for all the sessions that you were able to attend or watch and or watch.